It is uh, an honor to be in the uh, home vicinity uh, of Ambassador, uh, Assistant Secretary Chris Hill, someone who has a distinguished record of public service in the past, and I'm confident we'll, we'll see more of him in the future. It was also a delight while ago, I'm going to embarrass him, to run into Stan Harsha, uh, who is here. Stan, uh, formerly with the State Department, uh, and I used to uh, interact when he was serving in Indonesia. And I would travel to Indonesia on behalf of Senator Luber and the Foreign Relations Committee. So, Stan, thank you for your public service. Um, let me just begin tonight by saying I am uh, in all a little concerned about the size of this crowd. And uh, fortunately, there are no snowballs because there's no snow. And I don't see any tomatoes uh, around the room, so that's, that's a good beginning. Uh, I returned home to Indiana a while back, and someone there said, Keith, what do you do now that you're no longer working in the Senate? And I said, well, actually, I'm involved with this organization, and uh, we encourage engagement between the United States and North Korea. And uh, my friend in Indiana said, well, why would we want to do that? <laughs> and I think that that is typically the sentiment of a lot of people for reasons I understand given what we read, what we see, and, and the reality uh, in, in terms of uh, North Korea uh, today. Uh, actually, the comments I make tonight are my own. Uh, they are not on behalf of my organization. The National Committee of North Korea was established 11 years ago by the international aid organization known as Mercy Corps, uh, Els Culver, uh, who was responsible for setting up NCMK at a time of uh, difficulty in relations between the U.S. and North Korea, Ellis thought it was important that, especially in the humanitarian context, that the U.S. be engaging with the North. And so today we have 75 members. They are um, uh, nuclear scientists, such as Sig Hecker, who's been to North Korea. They are academics. Uh, our members include individuals whose organizations are working in North Korea on tuberculosis, uh, hepatitis, and so on. So, the one point they have in common is everyone favors engagement with uh, North Korea. And then we are, our, our financial funders are the Carnegie Corporation out of New York, uh, the Henry Luce Foundation, and Plowshares. Uh, so that is background about NCNK. But uh, I'm going to share some remarks. I want to leave time for Q&A. I want to have a conversation with you this evening because this is a, a difficult topic at a very troubling time. You and I are witness to an accelerating trajectory of events in and around North Korea, which in my opinion represent diminished prospects for a peaceful resolution of differences between our two countries. Uh, in other words, in my opinion, the United States and North Korea are now on a collision course. Recent attention has focused on North Korea's February 7 missile launch. Earlier was the January so-called hydrogen bomb test. Two of numerous events originating within North Korea, viewed by the international community as highly provocative. Now, as a backdrop, the United States and South Korea have been insisting that North Korea must abandon its nuclear program. The North Koreans insist that the U.S. must first enter into a peace, into a peace treaty with them. North Korea's leaders are convinced the United States prefers, prefers their elimination or collapse of their regime. American officials insist they are open to negotiation with North Korea. Neither side is budging. The six-party talks have failed. Bilateral talks between the United States and North Korea have failed. In recent days, South Korea has closed the Kaesong Industrial Complex where over 120 North Korea, South Korean companies have been employing over 50,000 North Korean workers. The Congress recently passed new sanctions legislation targeting North Korea, and I think the intent of this sanctions legislation was, was in essence, to provide more of a bite uh, in terms of, of sanctions. I do want to commend uh, Senator Gardner uh, from Colorado. Uh, he was the principal author, along with Senator Cardin, of the Senate version, uh, but on behalf of American humanitarian groups working in North Korea, we appreciated the fact that Senator Gardner, his staff, and others were willing to continue a humanitarian carve-out in the legislation so that work in North Korea helping the civilian population, usually out in the countryside, not in Pyongyang, 
who are suffering immensely from an emergency level of not only tuberculosis, but multi-drug-resistant tuberculosis, as well as hepatitis at emergency levels. Um, it's important from the perspective of our members who are humanitarian organizations that they be able to continue their work there. In addition, uh, in terms of other action items, uh, possible upcoming UN action in response to this month's missile launch. Uh, there will be more joint military exercises between South Korea and the U.S. military forces. It'll be interesting to watch the upcoming May Korean Workers' Party Congress in Pyongyang. This has not occurred for years. And so you, you can anticipate that Kim Jong-un uh, is intentionally looking and using this event to help tailor his, his idea, his plans long-term for the future. And so a lot of Americans who watch North Korea in terms of the personalities will be carefully looking at who's there, who's not there, uh, where did they go, uh, and so on. North Korea is often ridiculed and characterized in the international media through caricatures of the leadership and so on. Uh, they are convinced, North Korean leaders are convinced that they will have the last laugh. As their nuclear, chemical, biological, and cyber warfare programs continue to expand, North Korean leaders insist that they are developing a necessary defense mechanism to protect against a U.S. invasion. They point to Iraq. The warning of President Eisenhower of his willingness to use nuclear weapons to bring about an end to the Korean War, and later U.S. consideration of a nuclear response to North Korea's capture of the Pueblo, are points not lost on the North Koreans either. As an aside, all of the recent focus on North Korea's satellite launch, in my personal opinion, distracts from a reality that is rarely discussed in the United States. And that is that North Korea, by way of its trading companies and their vast international network, North Korea presently has the ability to place weapons of mass destruction or materials anywhere in the United States, including Colorado. There is an additional point of concern that was a long-term issue for Senator Luger. And so whenever I would go to North Korea on his behalf, uh, one of the points he asked that I always raised was about the security of their WMD material, whether that be nuclear or chemical or biological. Who's watching the shed, so to say? Who has the key? Who can have access to that material? What is the possibility in North Korea of an unhappy military official or party official deciding to access WMD and sell it to someone else in the world? So what is the protocol that they have in place to protect. But let's, let's pull back for a moment now and reflect upon some of the dynamics that are working in the country today. The country appears to be on two intentional and distinctly separate tracks. On one hand, the Supreme Leader, Kim Jong-un, continues to eliminate or punish, in other ways, a growing number of elites whether that be for disloyalty to him or for performance of their job. The elites in Pyongyang, the, the, the leadership class in Pyongyang, now are at the highest anxiety level they have been for years. They don't know what to expect. And he has also tightened the border with China. It's more difficult for North Koreans to escape. On the other hand, unlike his dad, Kim Jong-un has been allowing an unprecedented number of North Korean to leave the country to learn about international economics and the basics of business, how to make money. Over a thousand North Koreans have now been trained by the Singapore-based NGO called Chosen Exchange on business basics. Chosen Exchange trainers have been educating North Koreans in Singapore Vietnam, China, and they're actually able to go into North Korea and have classes about the basics of business and transitioning from a controlled economy to a market economy. I had opportunity year before last while in Singapore, unplanned, <clears throat> to sit in on a session where North Korean businesswomen were able to access the internet. They were in Singapore to learn about retail aspects of business, 
out of place products, and I'm, I'm just sitting there in disbelief that these North Korean women had been allowed to leave their country and to learn these things. Now, this, this chosen exchange is not the only experiment that's underway. At the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Professor Kyung A. Park hosts six North Korean professors each semester who audit business and economic related classes. These are not the only two examples of where North Koreans are learning about business and international economics. So the leader of North Korea, who on one hand is punishing a growing number of elites for a variety of infractions, on the other hand, he is supporting and facilitating efforts intended to help his country transition to a market economy. In the countryside, <clears throat> Farmers are now allowed to keep a larger portion of their crops for resale and personal gain. The leader is allowing factory managers. He's giving them greater autonomy in the decision-making process. He has a much publicized anti-corruption campaign to identify and to uh, punish corrupt government officials, and this has been met uh, uh, with great acceptance in the countryside. Bottom line, the North Korean leader is convinced that he can simultaneously expand his country's nuclear, chemical, biological, and cyber programs while developing the economy, the so-called Byung-Jen policy that he has. There are people in Washington who say, this is failing, it's going to collapse. <clears throat> well, they're not looking at the full picture. It's one thing in Washington or the United States or wherever to see North Korea the way we want it to be. It is another thing to see what is happening and how, in fact, do we engage to try to <clears throat> impact in the right way. Let's talk for a moment uh, how we view each other. The U.S. perspectives on North Korea are well known. Um, <clears throat> when we speak of peninsula unification, and often when South Korea speaks of peninsula unification, that often reflects a thinking on our part that there will be a collapse of the North Korean government and then the North will be absorbed by the South. That is how unification is often uh, perceived and represented in the South and the United States. The North Koreans reject that. <clears throat> they do not support the German model of unification. As we've had discussions, they'll point out to me that uh, well, with Germany, there was a winner and a loser. Um, they say, we prefer one country two systems, or a peninsula unified under our leadership. Americans often speak of North Korea's isolation. Now, in some respects, this is a myth. China, <clears throat> which refuses to implement United Nations sanctions targeting North Korea, continues to sustain North Korea through a variety of forms of assistance. In 2014, China reportedly issued over 200,000 visas for North Koreans to visit China and to go from China to other parts of the world for training, for business, and so on. That is not isolation. John, <clears throat> John Park with MIT has pointed out that an increasing number of the core elites are relocating to Beijing from Pyongyang so that they can evade sanctions and plug in to the global economy. North Korea has diplomatic relations with over 160 countries. While the United States is not one of those, our friends the British, the Germans, they have ambassadors in Pyongyang, and they are among those in the global community uh, who are there. One of North Korea's sources of revenue globally is in the field of animation. Their animation industry and their exports subcontract to companies throughout the world, including Europe. And there are reports that North Korean animation work has actually been included in some films shown in the US over the years. Through my travels to the North, interacting with North Koreans and reviewing their literature, I've developed my own perspective <clears throat> on their behavior and attitudes. For example, I discovered through my travels that North Korean analysis of foreign leaders includes a study of facial shape or phonology. And this is the case in South Korea as well, to some degree. In other words, <clears throat> the North Korean government has a file 
on every U.S. official that they know about. And in that file, part of their analysis of that U.S. official is their facial shape analysis. <clears throat> I came to discover this <clears throat> on more than one occasion in North Korea when, it was, when they determined that my personality and my responses to their questions did not match their conclusion about me based on my facial analysis. And we will leave it at that. <clears throat> also, I came to realize that a primary passion of Kim Jong-il was what maybe some of you know. What was his primary passion? Basketball is one. What else? Movies. Movies. Every time I would travel to the North, I would buy a book he had written. Or at least his name was on the book. <clears throat> because I'm always, and I continue to try to, to, to figure out how do they think, how do they process, how do they arrive at decisions. And through reading a number of these books, um, I discovered that he was first and foremost an artist. His passion was the arts. He was a producer. He was a choreographer. And by the way, he also had to run the country. In other words, his view of the world, in my opinion, was often through the prism or the perspective of a producer. <clears throat> I read one of the books he had written about the role of a producer in film. And in that book and others, I was fascinated by the inner, inner relationship he would connect between a producer and a leader, and how the worlds came together. So prior to a trip to, to Pyongyang, I contacted the North Korean Mission in New York, and I said, I've read the Dear Leader's book. When I'm in Pyongyang, I would like to have a, I'd like to meet with a cinematic official. Did you know that was an adjective? A cinematic official. I would like to meet with a cinematic official to get some clarification about his book. <clears throat> well, lo and behold, when I went to the North, they took me to the film studio. Had I asked to go to the film studio, that probably would not have occurred. <clears throat> but after touring the film studio, I asked the uh, local uh, tour guide I said, how often has the dear leader been here to provide personal instruction on movie making? Over 600 times. And that was at least two and a half years before he passed away. There are other things that I decided. I decided that uh, it's unlikely that he ever intended to negotiate away his nuclear program. And, I, and a final important point of distinction in my mind, between our two countries, is too often, not simply the United States, but too often, we do not, in our thinking about North Korea, and quite frankly, in our thinking sometimes about the rest of the world, and this brings in the importance of what you're about, too often, American officials do not incorporate the importance of cultural factors, cultural nuance. I need to stop there, or I will go down a road with it's too much of a distraction. But that relates to North Korea as well. <clears throat> After my first trip to North Korea, it became very clear that so much of their analysis about us was incorrect. I've also discovered over the years, <clears throat> in my opinion, that so much of the United States analysis about North Korea is incomplete because it's a closed country. Our professionals who do outstanding work do not have access. So consequently, both countries are operating uh, not at full steam, shall we say, in terms of their understanding of each other. So before we go to questions here, let's talk about the way forward. What are options that those involved in U.S. policymaking regarding North Korea consider, or should consider? Well, one option, and this is the driver presently, uh, will be continued and enhanced sanctions 
the effect of which, the desired effect of which, by those who promote sanctions, is a change in policy by North Korea about its view of the outside world, its provocative acts, and also <clears throat> those who usually promote sanctions are not disappointed if the regime would collapse. Which brings up another point. When we talk about collapse, what comes next? What comes next? There is an assumption that when people talk about a collapse in the North Korean government, that democracy will flourish, that, well, we don't know what would be next. So continued and enhanced sanctions will, will, will be the driver of the day. The Chinese, the Chinese have different interests than we have. We favor denuclearization. The Chinese care about regional stability. The Chinese are willing to put up with one, two, 10, 15 nuclear weapons next door, as long as they are of the opinion that the leadership will not engage in actions that pose a threat to stability into China. A second way of moving forward is engagement, attempted engagement. There are those that suggest that through facilitating change within North Korea, by facilitating change in its economy, by helping create an environment where people move into uh, a market economy, that this will in fact change the course of the leadership. Then there are those who say we should do both. And this probably is the prevailing thought, <clears throat> long term. The hope that there would be, on the part of some, the hope that there would be a combination of carrots and sticks, a combination of promoting engagement, but on the other hand, doing whatever is necessary in terms of sanctions to get the attention of the North Koreans. There is also a fascinating element that I've discovered, and that is those Americans and those Chinese who would be quite satisfied with retaining the status quo. Why is that? Why is that? Because as long as North Korea exists, it is a buffer between the United States and China, is it not? And the Russians have decided that the United States definitely wants it that way. Georgie, some of you know or know of uh, Georgie Tolaroya. Uh, Tolaroya is an academic. He's tied to government. He is one of Russia's top North Korean experts. Uh, he spoke at one of our events in Washington <clears throat> about a year ago. He said this, speaking North Korea, <clears throat> quote, keeping a hotbed of controlled tension near the Chinese border and the nuclear test has once again only added fuel to the fire and plays into the hands of the United States. It allows the U.S. to maintain a large group of troops, to modernize weapons, to keep allies on a short leash, as well as put pressure upon China. Therefore, the U.S. response to any North Korean action, no matter how provocative, will be sanctions and pressure rather than the search for a solution. After all, these sanctions have proven to be ineffective, and so on and so on. So that, that is the Russian perspective, at least from Tolaroya. But whatever <clears throat> the policy approach of the next president, um, another reality, and this happens not only in terms of North Korea policy, it happens in terms of foreign policy as a whole. Not all elements of the United States government, of the United States bureaucracy, necessarily pull the same direction in support of the president on any foreign policy initiative, but especially North Korea. This results, whatever the president's position may be, or the <clears throat> avowed policy of an administration, this undermines the president and it creates confusion not only within the administration, but within North Korea. On one trip to North Korea, <clears throat> visiting with Vice Minister Kim gae won he said, is President Bush in favor of a security guarantee for my country? 
Yes, President Bush had stated that. Kim Gay Guan looked at me and he said, well, then why did I just read, and he named the newspaper, why did I just read in this American newspaper where an unnamed administration source stated that the United States is creating a short list of attack sites for a direct hit on my country? And I said to the minister, when I read your KCNA, what do I believe? I don't know what to believe. And he said, you should pay more attention to quotes from the foreign ministry, of course, which he represented. <clears throat> My response to Kim Gay-Gwan was, and you should pay more attention to what the president says, because it is inevitable in the U.S. system, there will not always be total agreement. <laughs> in the Obama administration, <clears throat> You know, the North Koreans in New York are not allowed to travel uh, out 12 miles outside of New York. And as North Koreans request visas to come to the U.S. to visit, perhaps, for example, that an American NGO has, is working in North Korea and the North Koreans have asked that a doctor be trained or that some type of education or training occur, this requires uh, agreement by multiple agencies within the United States government. And this is an area of major disagreement. In fact, uh, over the past, uh, I don't want to say recent, but for quite a, for quite a while, uh, the United States has been unwilling to issue visas for North Koreans to visit here. And many in the U.S. government will say to me, Keith, we don't want to reward bad behavior by allowing them in. Others will say, well, you know, we want to allow them in because we want them to interact with us. This is why we want to be able to go into North Korea uh, and to encourage the international community to interact. So this is another reality uh, that exists. Finally, <clears throat> whatever the policy of the United States, what are some options in terms of how the intended policy could be implemented? And this is an area <clears throat> where I get into really deep trouble. Um, but, number one, uh, third-party mediator. In my opinion, given the level of acrimony and the deep mistrust between the leaders of the United States and North Korea, I am uncertain as to whether constructive bilateral negotiations are possible. Now, I understand why this is the case. On the part of the United States Executive Branch and the Congress, they are exhausted by North Korean provocative actions followed by charm offensive followed by provocative actions. And the Congress has had it. The sanctions that the Congress recently passed went beyond what the administration had hoped for because the administration would like to have more flexibility in its dealings with North Korea. Those in the Congress point out, well, where are we today? What about the sanctions that haven't been implemented? What about administrations that say they want to move ahead with sanctions but then they don't always enforce? So first there's the trust issue that we have with the North Koreans. On the part of the North Koreans, they do not believe that the President of the United States can actually deliver on an agreement if such were to occur, primarily for two reasons. Number one, what I just shared with you about undermining of the President within an administration. Secondly, the North Koreans aren't certain that the Congress would go along. In fact, the North Koreans are of the opinion the Congress is probably blocked the effort or agreement by a president. So, first option, third-party mediator. Second option, multiple simultaneous negotiations between the U.S. State Department and the North Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So, so first of all, U.S. State Department talking to the North Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs. At the same time, we would have the CIA negotiating directly with the North Korean Security Service. 
We would have the Pentagon negotiating directly with the North Korean military, and we would have U designated U.S. officials talking directly to the Korean Workers' Party. Now, whatever would occur in that regard should be done in consultation with South Korea, obviously, Japan, and when possible, China and Russia. Third option, <clears throat> military to military negotiations between North Korea and the United States on the Korean War POW MIA human remains issues. Now, usually in Washington, this issue is talked about in terms of human remains. And to the credit of consecutive administrations and to the credit of our Pentagon, there has always been a consistent effort to try to work with North Korea. In fact, up until 2005, between 1996 and 2005, over 200 sets of remains were brought out of North Korean identified. But what about the fact that at the end of the Korean War, there are over 7,000 Americans left behind, unaccounted for in North Korea? Why shouldn't we be asking the North Koreans to provide us with information they have on those who are still alive at the end of the war? Certainly, some were taken to Russia. Some may have been taken to China or elsewhere. But the families of those individuals in the United States deserve information. Now, the South Korean officials tell me, now, they estimate today that about 500 or so South Koreans continue to be held against their will in North Korea from the war. I'm not certain. I don't know that any Americans are still alive. But the adage that we leave no man or woman behind in war is not true in terms of the Korean War. And in my opinion, military to military discussions between the United States and North Korea on this issue, perhaps that could be a point of beginning to get into other areas. Now, to the present and past administrations, that's not acceptable because first is denuclearization, and I, I understand that. This is serious business. If, if North Korea, if North Korea continues the development of nuclear weapons unless this is stopped, then Japan will want to proceed. South Korea will want to proceed. All right, fourth, in terms of another option, human rights. Uh, the UN Commission of Inquiry report on the human rights situation in the North has certainly elicited elicited a response from that country. The North Koreans have a desire to engage in dialogue. This approach, of course, would, would require coordination with the UN and the global community. Five, a presidential envoy as another option, meaning someone at such a high level that the leadership of North Korea would view that appointment as showing respect for his position. And finally, whatever happens with the next administration, uh, in my opinion, the next president should partner with the Congress from day one on North Korea policy. Partner in the sense of bringing in leadership and, and establishing a protocol by which there would be regular consultation and planning as we move ahead. Let me stop there and uh, see what questions or comments you have. In your introduction, the word uh, increasing oppression of the people of North Korea. You mentioned the People's uh, Union Working Party or something of that nature. What is your impression of the life and the, and, and the, and, and the condition of the population of North Korea? In terms of the elites in Pyongyang, uh, those who, I mean, if, if you were living in Pyongyang, it's because you were selected to live in Pyongyang because you matter to uh, the government, to the leadership. So life in Pyongyang uh, is ostensibly better than that in the countryside. Um, however, throughout North Korea, there is a continual perpetual state of malnutrition, um, even among the elites. There is a state of malnutrition to some degree. Others would argue with me on that. Um, but I would say that uh, keep in mind what's fascinating is that Kim Jong-il, the previous leader, 
really work to build up the elites. <coughs> Countryside is here. His successor, his son, has the elites now very fearful. The son is working with some success to obtain support from people in the countryside because of how they see him moving ahead. I was recently with a former South Korean minister who stated publicly that a middle class is now developing in North Korea because of the increased trade with China, because of efforts to move into a market economy. Another question? At the beginning of your talk, you mentioned or said that you thought we were on a collision course with North, North Korea. Number one, is that military? And if it is a military collision course, what do you think it would take for North Korea to initiate military action? What kind of event, what would it be that would trigger it for them? I can't answer the second question. I apologize because the present leader, more so than his dad, likes to be unpredictable. Now, let me set that aside and say, when I say collision course, I, I, I mean that in the context. Not, not, I, I, I'm not suggesting that North Korea today would launch a first strike against South Korea or Japan or the United States. However, the level of anxiety within the region, the level of concern among military leaders it is getting to a point where there is increasing possibility of a collision course by accident or by miscalculation. And that's the type of situation which I think is of great concern to people in our government. And in North Korea, uh, the leader is of the opinion, clearly, that he has this under control the way he sees it. Time will tell. Another question? Uh, could you recommend some books or periodicals uh, on North Korea that would be useful to a reader? <laughs> when I worked uh, at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, my number one challenge daily was, what is the truth? Uh, and as you're putting together memos for Dick Luger or for other members, um, when it comes to North Korea, there is a lot written about the country. Um, very little of that is, is based on primary sources or first information. To answer your question directly, uh, one of the books that I recommend is The Two Koreas by Don Oberdorfer. And Bob Carlin uh, helped write the revised Two Koreas. Another book that I especially enjoy is called Tyranny of the Week by Professor Charles Armstrong at Columbia. And Professor Armstrong does something which we rarely do in the United States, and that is he ties together the pre-Korean War, Korean War, post-Korean War, how all this contributes to where we are today. And as, as is often the case with East Asia as a whole, we as Americans, whether we're in business or government, we don't always take the long-term view, but they do. And so both the two Koreas and the tyranny of the week are books that I think uh, help pull that together. There are, there are other books out there as well. In terms of other publications, there are some that are outstanding. Uh, and I'll just leave it at that. Do we have anybody on this side of the room? When I was on the DMZ, it looked pretty impressive to me as to anybody having much success getting from the north to the south. And I'm wondering uh, if this sort of thing has been increased to the extent that virtually nobody makes it, or somebody makes it once in a while. The uh, 
Kim Jong Un, the present leader, has ramped up uh, security along the borders, and so it is so. The, the bottom line: the number of North Korean refugees slash defectors now making their way out of the country, that number has drastically uh, reduced. Any other questions? Is the populace still reverential of their leaders as uh, Kim Il and his father and grandfather? I don't know. <laughs> However, um, in North Korea now, you have over three three million cell phones. Uh, however, most of those uh, you cannot access outside of North Korea, but an increasing number you can. And so, through cell phones, through increased travel, as, as I shared with you earlier about North Koreans being able to travel to Singapore, wherever, in Asia. Uh, at this point, North Korea has over 90,000 workers in China. North Korea has 2,500 workers in Mongolia. North Korea has thousands of workers in Russia, in the Middle East. Now, these workers receive a pittance of what they're supposed to receive because the government in fact, this is a source of revenue for North Korea that you will see uh, in, the, in the time ahead. You'll see more and more countries, perhaps at the UN, focusing on all these workers, not only in the human rights context, the conditions, uh, but because of the amount of money that uh, the government derives from their work. In fact, South Korean officials last week, when they closed the Kaesong Industrial Complex. They cited a massive amount, millions of dollars, that went from workers' pay, intended workers' pay, out of Kaesong to develop North Korea's missile program. But I don't want to go, I'm getting off track. To get back to your point, um, increasing number of North Koreans now are leaving the country. They are, they are traveling back and forth. Uh, there is an increasing amount, increasing level of South Korean soap operas going into the North. Uh, a lot of information is getting into the North. So it's fascinating because Kim Jong Un worked to promote a theocracy, in essence, and for that to succeed, it was important that as much information be contained as possible, or excuse me, kept from getting in, um, his son is taking a different approach. And his son apparently is of the opinion that as people in North Korea learn about the rest of the world, that they will in fact stay loyal to him. Uh, the New York Philharmonic had a successful visit to North Korea with some concerts. Does that mean that maybe the arts will play a more important role, be part of the solution in establishing stronger relationships? It's a personal opinion that uh, let, let, let's try it all. Arts, sports, whatever as Americans we can do, not only to encourage American engagement with North Korea in all these areas, but to encourage other parts of the world to interact with the North. One of our members, one of the members of our organization is George Vitale, a retired New York City policeman, who is a Taekwondo master. And for years, uh, George Vitale has been going into North Korea, uh, helping work with North Korean Taekwondo uh, specialists. So he has his own bridge of diplomacy, if you will. And it's through this individual contact when the North Koreans see what people are really like. That, to me, is what brings value 
uh, and, and perhaps contributes long term to, to change. So I don't believe there is a silver bullet, but personally speaking, I believe that through a combination of uh, a variety of engagement options, that long term, this can contribute to change in the country. And again, I said long term. Any more questions? Could the South Korean government help us in establishing a better relationship with the North? It depends. The, early in the Obama administration, there was a willingness on the part of our government to actually follow South Korea's lead with the North. And the Obama administration, like the Bush administration, has worked diligently to, to interact with, with South Korea. Uh, President Park gun has launched several proposals with the North, whether that be family reunions, sports, on and on and on. The North responded on the family reunion angle. Uh, there has been some interaction on sports. There has been some interaction in the area of religion. Uh, and so President Park has made this effort. She is willing to be helpful to us. But the North Koreans, for the most part, it seems, have decided to spurn her efforts. Uh, and so today, I'm not certain uh, the extent to which let, let me just say that I think everything's happening that, that can be under the, under the present circumstances. There is, I believe there is close interaction, coordination, communication between South Korea and the United States. Another question? Uh, I read that the calendar that they use uh, starts with the birth of the original Kim. Uh, and are they, is that a practical thing or are they in tune with the rest of the world in terms of airline flights and our regular calendar and times? For the most part, that is a domestic adaptation, uh, but at the same time, they acknowledge that the rest of the world runs on a different calendar. So in many respects, they work to uh, abide by both the best that they can. What role does Ban Ki-moon in the United Nations have in all of this, since he's from South Korea? What influence does he have in the UN? And you have this UN mission, the North Koreans in New York City, you said they couldn't go more than 12 miles. Are there people communicating with them? Um, is that, is that a, a, an avenue? Yes. Um, it seems to me that Ban Ki-moon, in addition to his formal role at the United Nations, uh, probably continues to work behind the scenes to attempt to facilitate any sort of improvement in the overall situation. Um, so, so he, I believe he is active not only publicly, uh, but, but also uh, behind the scenes. And yes, in terms of the North Koreans in New York, um, the, the New York Channel, as it is called, that is the primary point of contact between the United States government and North Korea. Now, because NCNK, our National Committee of North Korea, is dedicated to engagement, I, I go and visit with them every three to four months. And uh, we have an opportunity to ask questions on... But the North Koreans, uh, uh, as of several months ago, said they would no longer talk to the U.S. government. So. As the U.S. government was making an effort, as the Obama administration was reaching out again, the North Koreans pulled back. Having said that, uh, New York is uh, a point of location on the map. It's an important location, but uh, North Korea has embassies around the world. Uh, when the United States uh, negotiated the release of two reporters who were in North Korea that resulted in former President Clinton going to get their, re 
get their release. Um, I, I know that there was one set of negotiations going on in New York, between New York and some American officials in the congressional branch who thought who wanted to be helpful. At the same time, the U.S. executive branch was negotiating with the North Koreans through their Singapore embassy. And it was through the Singapore embassy that eventually that arrangement was, was, was made. So the New York Channel is important, but uh, it's not the only point of contact uh, with North Korea. I have a question for you. In your own belief, has Kim Jong-un been truthfully informed about the extent and severity of the malnutrition of his people? And if so, is he addressing that? Um, I, I have no idea as to the dynamics of his inner circle and what he has told. Um, it is a personal opinion that Kim Jong-un, like his dad, uh, Kim Jong-il, had full information about everything going on in the country at all levels. And um, given the fact that that information is, is there, uh, I think that the other answer to your question is, is obvious in terms of the emphasis that is placed on Pyongyang, the emphasis that is placed on uh, caring for the elites. Uh, having said that, he does allow, as his father, they, they do allow international humanitarian organizations to work in the rural areas, to work in concert with North Korean health organization in local areas. Um, and it's, it's fascinating in that, uh, in terms of observing those NGOs that have remained in North Korea versus those who have departed, either because they were asked to do so or they just found it very difficult. Ultimately, this gets back to relationship building at the local level. For example, between American healthcare workers and their North Korean counterparts. Usually what happens over time is that the North Korean counterparts at the local level end up advocating to their regional leaders and beyond that the Americans be allowed to continue and to work with them. Well, he knows about this. His dad knew about it, and they allowed it. So uh, that's another way of answering your question. Having said that, while, while that is allowed, uh, a massive amount of money in North Korea goes toward uh, support of the elites and goes toward developing an infrastructure uh, in that regard. More questions? One more <laughs> Somewhere in your speech, you talked about cultural factors, and I'd like you to expand on that. What what kinds of things need to be considered? <laughs> One example. Uh, Stan, close your ears for a moment, please. Um, one of the areas over the years where I failed uh, on behalf of Senator Luger with the State Department, I uh, repeatedly encouraged the State Department prior to any meeting with North Koreans to share, to exchange with the North Koreans a glossary of terms, to make certain that each side actually understood the words and the phrases that the other side was using. Based on my experience, there is a lot of misunderstanding. I think this is important. Now, having said that, that's separate than the decisions made by leader Kim Jong-un, all right? That's, that's a different challenge. Um, secondly, uh, it's been my experience years ago when I was in business traveling to East Asia, it's been my experience working at the committee, that often we as Americans 
do not factor in the issue of face, which varies from country to country or culture to culture, but it is an issue. And uh, those, those are just two examples. There are many others. Any more questions? More than Okay. Oh, wait. Here. Here we go. Uh, just a small issue. <clears throat> I understand that the South Koreans have set up these large banks of uh, PA systems and they're broadcasting into North Korea and that they can go 10 to 15 miles. Uh, two questions. One, is that still going on? And two, is it having any effect? As of, I don't know if it's still happening as of today. Clearly, when it was, you may recall that this um, started more recently following the landmine incident in the demilitarized zone where uh, South Koreans were injured, South Korean military individuals were injured as a result of landmines placed for the North Korean. The response of the loudspeakers was was significant on the part of the North. It was it was major. Um, to the credit of President Park and Hay, you know, she was willing to to make that effort to do that, even though she knew it would elicit a certain response. Uh, so this this is an area of great aggravation to them. Uh, when it happens. There are other ways of conveying information that they don't like. You know, some organizations in South Korea will send balloons across into the north with information. Uh, so anything that brings in information in that context, uh, especially along the DMZ where you have such a, a huge number of military, North Korean military, who will be hearing this, that, that's a fact. I think we have one more here. I think it was the uh, a recent edition of The New Yorker had a depiction of the current leader in North Korea as an infant, dressed as an infant, uh, playing with his toys, which were missiles and bombs. Um, I, I'm sure they see this sort of thing that comes out of here, but uh, that seems to be uh, something that would just keep, <laughs> not improve things at all. This gets back to my, my earlier point about the level of acrimony. Uh, the United States is involved in name-calling caricatures. The North Koreans are involved in name-calling, <laughs> and they're caricatures of us. And so the question becomes, are we at the level, are we at the point where there is such anger, uh, such lack of face, getting back to the cultural aspect, that it will require a third party of some sort to serve as a mediator to, to get the two sides to talk. I don't know the answer to that. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Lee.